So the business of the future will be small and simple, not large and complex, even if it is a large business. It will operate as if it's small. The technological advances that will disrupt markets in the future and the patterns of business will increasingly be small and simple changes, but they will paradoxically force the reevaluation of everything. Consider the simple insight, the simple idea of running an application on the web in a browser instead of on your PC. That's a small, if you think about it, it's a small idea that has this enormous impact on the world and led to the complete disruption of the enterprise software market worldwide. A better example, the simplicity of voice. What could be more natural than talking to a speaker in your kitchen to get the weather or a recipe or to order more napkins. The impacts of that apparently small insight is going to change everything. I know this is one of the places where uh, the buying of these voice-based computer systems is starting to grow, but it's had an enormous impact in just a few years in the United States, where tens of millions of people now use these on a, a daily basis, and a huge shift is going on to voice computing. So similar small changes in your business, your business operating system, could have sim similar enormous repercussions, even though it seems like a small idea. One of my favorite examples, meetingless Fridays. Many companies in the States are doing meetingless Fridays or meetingless Wednesdays, a day when there are no meetings. Everyone has a huge benefit from that. It seems like a very small idea, but everyone gets enormous benefit out of it. So you have to look beyond the obvious first order effects of these kinds of small changes. And don't expect that the biggest paybacks for your company are going to come from spending $20 million on a new human resources system. You know? This meaningless Fridays, I guarantee you, would have a bigger impact for your business. Open and public, not closed and private. The number one factor in work happiness, at least in the US, is transparency of management practices. People are more engaged with the business if they believe that they understand what management's plans are. And to the degree that they don't, they are increasingly dissatisfied, unhappy. So the model of platform like Jeff Bezos is a great example. It leads to higher engagement at work. Early on, he said he was going to transform the software that ran their e-commerce platform into a product, Amazon Web Services, which is obviously eight, ten billion dollars a year now in revenue. But more importantly, he decided and imposed a management edict that everything done in the company would be put onto that platform and all of the data would be available and no data would be private inside the company, not shared with the wide world. And there were no exceptions to that rule or you're fired. Now that led to a very expensive and long-term commitment to changing the business operations of Amazon. And some of the complexities are extremely you know, deep computer science. But the, uh, the benefit is that they can launch a new line of business in a matter of a few days and leverage all the data that they have from other lines of business, and off they go. And so their success is 
undeniable, and I believe that it's principally based on this notion of open and public data on the platform they built. So in a sense, it's like a tax that you pay, and it costs time and energy, but you build an infrastructure like streets and railroad lines, and then for decades afterwards, you get the benefit of it. Notably, as I said before, your company is one of the members of the vanguard in this regard. Today's management theory and organizational structure, in general, is still a holdover from the earliest days of the industrial era, a time prior to democracy, when monarchies ruled, or even stretching back to the Bronze Age. Most businesses today are oligarchies. That means the few lead the many. And in recent decades, there's been a transition from co coercion of employees to more consensual models. But if we are to move fast enough to compete in this new economy, we'll have to move to a hyper-lean and agile and more democratic form factor. Now, democracy in business is not like democracy in politics. It's not everybody has an equal vote, right? But it does mean that everybody should have a voice in decisions that impact them. An opportunity suggests fixes to problems, or just to be able to gripe about messes, things that are broken in your company's systems, without being afraid that you're going to have retribution. You have to have the ability to speak up. And the last couple of points here are actually the most potent, have the biggest impact. So I've built up to what may be the most important points. The nature of strategy changes in a time of great change, when the future is difficult to foresee. And we are at that time in human history of the most difficulties in figuring out what is going to happen next week, next month, next year. It's an unprecedented time. So the, rule, the role of leadership has to change to suit that time. And instead of concocting a single strategic vision at headquarters and pushing it out to the entire organization through managerial channels, that's the deliberate style of strategy. Instead, leadership has to shift to distributed, action-based strategic learning about what is actually happening in the market, what's actually happening with your customers. That's emergent strategy. It has to be distributed to the edge. Everyone in the company has to be involved. So emergence is a property of complex systems. You're accepting the fact that you're living in a complex world and your business is complex. But it does not mean chaos, but unintended order. This is order that emerges from the interactions of all of the participants. The new way of work is a bigger break with the industrial model as the industrial model was with the artisanal and agricultural era that came before it. We're at a juncture just like that, the shift from agriculture to industry, and now we're shifting from industry to the network world, the digital world. So unlike the last transition, we're not going to be looking for inspiration from armies or the slave battalions that built the pyramids. Instead, we will look to nature, ecosystems, and the growth of cities for inspiration. The new business of the near future will be run more like a forest 
or a city than a machine. We need to learn by imitating rich ecosystems where the appar appearance of chaos actually means emergent order. And we have to give up on order imposed by edict, by order from on high. The largest change, and actually the largest barrier to this transition, is the refactoring of leadership. Your chairman has said the biggest barrier to people adopting models like Hire has is the willingness of leadership to give up more control to the organization. We have to move away from consensus-oriented oligarchies, where small groups are making all the decisions for them. Leadership, as a result, is going to be profoundly distributed. It's diffused across the organization as individuals and networks grow increasingly autonomous, cooperative work becomes the norm, and emergent strategy decentralizes direction setting. Leadership in a deep culture business will seem more like a town council. The village elders getting together and making decisions with the input of everybody in the village. And it will not look like royalty anymore. Or even the 20th century management elites. We've seen the fall of companies like GE, for example. Uh, their approach is over. And the psychological difficulties in that transition for today's leaders may be the biggest single barrier for them. If they don't, if they can't personally accept the change in their status and who they are and how they define meaning for themselves or the, the value they are supposed to be bringing to their business, we'll see more and more businesses of that sort fail and go out of business. In the 20th century, a company like IBM or Ford may have built up a distinctive corporate culture. And they may have thought that was a good thing. And it might have been. It might have helped them in that era. But the biggest trick is to build a company that matches the era that you are in, not the one from 50 years ago. Even today, people are endlessly discussing how to create a good corporate culture as if that could be done, like baking a cake or designing a phone. Don't get me wrong, corporations do have culture. And they can be distinctive. But it is not necessarily the case that the distinctiveness of corporate cultures is as great as people generally think. Maybe we should put aside the question of whether or not creating a corporate culture can be done, and instead ask another question. Can we create a larger and shared culture of work that subsumes organizational culture, that is larger than the culture of any single business? And in a sense, that deeper corporate culture could replace individual corporate culture. I think that's a, a necessary outgrowth of something like Hire's platform, as you bring more and more outsiders into your platform to collaborate with the company, you start to share a larger sense of work culture that isn't limited by the boundaries of your business. It includes your users. It includes your partners. It includes your supply chain. Otherwise, you wouldn't succeed if you weren't sharing common understanding of the world. But it's no longer just hires culture. It's the culture of everybody in the ecosystem. My sense is that turnover is so high in most organizations that the distinctiveness of corporate culture is decreasing all the time. People are coming and going and coming and going. Maybe that doesn't happen at hire. But in most companies, there's a very high turnover. And people are constantly coming and going, so 
they bring in new ideas, and unless they completely for, you know, forget everything they learned in the past, they have to have an impact. So there's demographic changes at work uh, in the workforce, particularly in the US, Gen Xers and millennials are di displacing what we call boomers, me. They're displacing me, people my age. So new societal norms are permeating the business context already and swamping the 20th century boomer-centric culture of most businesses. The re-engagement of the workforce is not likely to arise by managements trying to refocus workers' attention on the company's goals, or at least not at first. We all have to first agree, as individuals, leaders, and organizations, that each person must first re-engage with their own work, their own calling, their own occupation. The designer with design, the marketer with the discipline of marketing, and the engineer with her engines. The connection between each person and their calling has to become primary, or there will be no engagement with the company's goals in the long term anyway. This is not preaching disloyalty to the company. On the contrary, but acceptance of a higher loyalty to the new ethics of work, where our affiliation is to our own work and our network of respected others, the people we want to respect us. And that hopefully overlaps with what the other people believe too. So even today, professionals are unlikely, and at least in the United States, to take a job at a company that does not explicitly commit to the three elements of the new ethos of work. Personal mastery of your skills and your, your job. Autonomy, increased autonomy, more control of what you do and who you work with. And the, the, um, the positive regard of those that you respect. As more individuals and companies build on those pillars, we are each of us joining a broader and deeper culture, one that becomes more important than the smaller and narrower culture of standalone organizations. And by that, we are all better off, and so are our companies. As I said at the outset, we have serious challenges to adapt to a world that is changing in every dimension all at once. I believe our primary responsibility has to be to go deep, to reconsider the principles that underlie our businesses, the motivations and moorings of what we do at work and how. It is an existential imperative we must face the hard need to make deep change at the core of work culture if we are to thrive as individuals, as businesses, throughout the economy, and across the world where we live. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>